it and and I think the vast response to the film has been asking for forgiveness, which of course no one needs to forgive us for anything, but as Carolina, whom you met in the film, says succinctly, it's the first time that a whole new generation of Chile really understands what the background and the thinking of Doug, uh, Doug was and could really see the story in its full form. And I think that eventually will be the goodness and value of, of the film. <laughs> Amazing. Um, and Chai, I want to turn to you. And we spoke about this a little bit months ago. I know, you know, Doug and, and Chris and Rick and Yuan, some of these are heroes of you and Jimmy, and maybe especially Jimmy. And that is a huge amount of responsibility and undertaking to do justice to the story of your heroes, you know, no pressure. So I guess maybe tell us a little bit about that feeling of going into this with um, kind of that on your shoulders and also doing justice to all these amazing threads of stories. It's a love story, it's an entrepreneur story, and it's a big environmental story. So it's a big question, but you can take your time. Thank you. So it was two-pronged. It's kind of like the damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. Like, let's make a movie about your husband's mentors. I mean, you can only lose, like, right? Like, if, if Jimmy's unhappy, I'm going to live with it. I mean, he's the father of my children, our children, um, my children. Um, um, and if his mentors are unhappy, like, that's really, Jimmy's still unhappy. So, like, everyone's unhappy. And balancing that with, you know, kind of where we are in our careers, right? Like, I know the type of films I want to make. I know the type of films I'm capable of making. I know the types of films I have to make. And so that was a really tricky thing. But, like, most of our films I'd be back into. I don't want to make a movie. I'm really happy to hang out with those two kids. Um, and, like, every time we make a film, like, you know that you're going to have to, like, bleed for it. You're going to go to the end of the earth. Like, you have to. If you're going to do it, why are you doing it? You would do it to make it great. And so you, I, we always back into movies, and it's like, really, do you really want to film Alex Honnold almost dying, like, over and over again? Um, but, um, sorry. Um, but what happens is, like, the issue becomes so pressing and profound and meaningful, and that's what, what kind of converts us. And for me, the story here about second chances and third chances, the idea that Doug Tompkins was at the, like he had founded the North Face, he founded Esprit, they were everything at the time. And he's like, I still can do more, and I'm willing to walk away from this. And then Chris, having had this amazing career building Patagonia, meeting somebody and finding like another love of her life in her late 40s, and will, being willing to be like, this is what matters, even though your entire community, your family, because like, you've got quite a family. Like, they're all in Northern California. And I can't imagine doing that in terms of my parents. Like, I can't imagine leaving them that far behind. And, um, or away. And this idea that, like, you can have several lives. And you can be brave enough to try that. And, you, and especially as, you know, you know, our climate crisis is the crisis of our time. And having lived through the pandemic with our kids who are now nine and seven, and experiencing, like feeling their fear when they're so small, like messed me up. And I was like, you know, here is a story that shows that if you put one foot in front of the other, you just do something and it matters. You know, and you can be brave. You can, you know, like, and the thing, the real thing that really kind of compelled me to make it finally was watching Chris like pick yourself up after 2015 when Doug passed and it was hard you know it was really really was hard, hard. <clears throat> it was really hard but it was also like I'm now saying this as me not as like Chris or Chris is my friend in that uh, you know there are a lot of women who support very want, like powerful and innovative men and you know Chris had built Patagonia next to Yvonne Chouinard she had built Tompkins Conservation next to Doug. And the worst happens, and you still find a way to make the horrible decisions that are really painful personally, but they still matter. And 
that voice of a woman in this time, in this dealing with the most important question of our time, um, really compelled me to brave my husband's ire and his 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 mentor's ire. Anyway, but like the point was, like, it just was incredibly personal, and we had to make the movie. <laughs> I'm just overcome with emotion. We're a central character I had never met, um, which was Doug. I had never met him, and he had passed. And again, it was the personal connection that was really tricky for me. And then finally, it kind of was that they lived this life, like they lived many lives. Like this film spans from when you were like 16 through today, and that idea of time was really tricky. And then, as with most films, you could make five films with one film. And you know, the, my favorite like example is like there was the Casanova free solo, where Alex was like the lover <laughs> from the beginning, and like Jimmy was like, "What have you done?" And I was like, "But we learned something from that version." And for this, like this could have been Doug's film, it could have been Yvonne's film, it could have been Esprit's film, or The North Face, or Patagonia's <laughs> film. But the point of why we made it because it's Chris's story. And it, it tries to really do like bring to life the other participants here, but you know making that decision to put Doug's funeral in the beginning was a really big deal. But it also defined the movie because it was about regeneration. It was about finding your voice. It was about what are we doing right now today. And so let's talk a little bit about that decision and also some of the other tough things that you have to decide, making obviously that passing a part of the story and representing it visually in certain ways. What, what kind of conversations um, went into that? How did you end up with um, what, what you have in the film um, kind of animated? Both you and, and Chris, was that a discussion that you jointly have? I don't think so. <laughs> no. So you gave that <laughs> complete control. No, my, my only point was, if you do it, take everything. Mm -hmm. The 26 years of journals, 250,000 photographs, nudes, you name it. <laughs> take <laughs> all of it because my only fear really has ever been, I'm not interested in someone's version of Chris and Doug. It's not, for me, it's, that would be a travesty. If you're going to do it, throw it all in there. So I know my family, friends, <laughs> lawyers, <laughs> and I said, I'm sorry, we do it, all of it, or nothing. And, you know, so, so I'm bringing this up because then Jimmy and, and especially Chai can funnel through all of these things and decide how do you tell a story which actually starts when I'm eight and I'm 72 now. So as a very, it's a mouse with a very long tail. <laughs> and um, I can't stand stories that are edited toward a center line of comfort or civility that I had zero interest in. And, and that's why Chai and Jimmy were and remain the only people we would ever do it with because um, I had no interest in something sweet about two people who weren't all that sweet. <laughs> <laughs> you are a pioneer in um, um, conservation and you're, you're leading the way and you're inspiring both at an individual level and I would hope at a you know, cor corporate level too. So. I'm wondering if you have some words for us before I open it up to the audience to take a couple of questions. What are some of the things that you hope that people kind of just get to work with after seeing this film? Just little contributions, but maybe more importantly, what would you like kind of corporate America to take away from this? There's another well, way I would of being, like to there is another corporate way America to take almost everything away from this. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me started. That's why having Yvonne Chouinard here this week, first of all, as a family, it was very important, and the team members from Chile and Argentina who are sitting here tonight. But um, firstly, I, I, I feel like I owe women a debt. I, when I was still CEO of 
Patagonia Time Magazine came to interview me. They were doing a very early article on the glass ceiling in corporate America um, for women. And I had never been exposed, not through our family and certainly not with Yvonne. So I was like a deer in headlights. I just said, well, for me, this, these issues aren't pertinent. I don't know what I can say about it. I was very young when I answered in such a almost glib and really an inappropriate way, inappropriate way. So I have always felt that um, that was never the point to just take my personal relationship to power. And so, so now, of course, I see it in completely different um, in, in focus in a way that I, I, I'm very, most of the people who run everything I've ever done, they are. Um, I can't remember what, oh, in terms of what to do with your life, you know, I'm very fanatical about it now. I don't care if you're 80 or 12. I really does not matter where you come from, what you have, what you don't want. And, and, and what you're seeking out. If you're not on the road of stepping up and actively changing the direction that we're facing right now, then you are in the caboose on a very long train. And I always, somebody, poor Sot, asked me how I feel about hope recently, and I went, for Cirque, and I said, we can't, you, you, you have to work for hope. You have to, to earn being hopeful. And earning hope means action. And as Edward Abbey said, um, sentiment in the absence of action is the ruination of the soul. And, and I have come to see that and in all its current velocity, so. Um, that's how I feel about abdicating, or moving away from abdicating our futures to those you think will make the right decisions. It's clearly, they won't. <laughs> a, a big a cut a swath, the film cuts a swath, I think, very well about Doug Tompkins. But what was interesting, and I think the most interesting thing about him, is that he, he fell in love toward the end of his life and he was all in. And I was never all in, in my marriages or, and that is why the things that drove me insane, and there were plenty, it became the fabric and in some ways the threads that, that ended up sewing us together. Because I'm no day at the park either. And um, I think that's why evil and everybody was so nervous about the two of us having fallen in love because they thought it was really gas on a fire. And it was. <laughs> and it was. <laughs> so when we're unhappy, I think, and leading lives that we're very good with, good at, and extremely clever and fabulous. If, though, those lives don't come in to parallel with who you hope you would become, you're not really nice people. You're not inherently happy about getting out of bed every day and then can't wait until you have to get back into bed at night. And that's a very, the things that make us often so disagreeable are manifested in the things that we feel we can't turn away from because of our self-image and so on. So, no, there was everything to love about Doug. The rest was really easy. It was. Thank you. Oh, that's sweet. Um, back, anybody else from Argentina? Uh, the End of the World Park was um, finalized and brought into creation in October of 2010.
22.